Good morning, afternoon, and evening to anybody, anybody who's out there. My name is Phil Keeling. Welcome back to Meet Your Makers, the show where we talk to the writers, creators, developers, artists who make the games that we all love so very, very much to play. And today with me, very special guest, it's Chant Evans. Everyone, give it up. Oh, right, you can't. Uh, that's... They, they're, they're, they're losing their minds. They're, they're, their hands are growing numb with the amount of times that their palms are clapping against each other. Exactly. Well, we don't want to go that far. I don't know how much power we want to give. I mean, you, you already have so much. Yeah, always more. Always more. <laughs> Chat, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us, tell us all uh, where, where, where we might know you from. I was about to say you're 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 a busy person. That that's that's all over the place. I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, uh, we're just going to get straight into the stories. Then uh, stories, questions. They turn into stories if you want them to turn into stories. It's entirely up to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's start with the the very short, very simple. I'm sure it'll be a very succinct answer. Uh, how'd you get started in uh, in game development and writing? I'm sure this will this will be a quick one, so knock it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey uh real quick chant let me check something we, we got word from the uh the chat that uh, your audio isn't hitting for some reason which I don't know why that would be. La 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 la. I disagree. I disagree. Any any time you get to throw dice in a uh, actual castle is good by me. So that's definitely something I want to do at some point. Let me see here. Modern inputs. Everything on my end should be. Yeah, that's weird. Let's see. Yeah, I'll find out. Let me see. Hold on, I'm going to play a dangerous game here. Testing one, two, three. Okay, give me give me some give me some audio chant. I don't know why. Talk to me. I think 
I might be a little quiet. Give me a, give me another. Recite, recite the Jabberwocky. I know you can. <laughs> yeah, it's not coming through. That's weird. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. The 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 stream we 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 have this. This is this is an this is an opportunity, is what this is. An opportunity to create a new avant garde kind of stream, where the guy nobody came here to listen to has all the power and uh let's see yeah yeah exactly exactly i think that's that's important we got it, it because it puts the audience in a very active place <laughs> exactly oh the questions well okay i think we've got you i think because i uh i'm not gonna we're not gonna go into uh why you disappeared momentarily uh audio wise because it does nothing uh but make me look stupid and no no that's not the point of this show no no it was censorship it, it was, was state <laughs> secrets exactly. it was all of the upcoming onyx path 2025 slate that you yep. will never know about yep. chat yep. <laughs> it was it was it was all all of that we were trying to protect OPP. That's what we are going for here, and that's and that's good enough reason for most, I think. So let me let me see here, make sure we're underway. I think we're, I think I'm frozen, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I care a little bit. Well, I I I I've frozen. My, I'm frozen on a face where I look like, I don't know. Tell us in the chat what what you think I look. I look like I've just been given some shocking news. Uh, so, all right. So, but let's, let's, uh, let's pick up from there, uh, uh, uh chant. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, <laughs> tell us. Uh, I wouldn't mind. Tell us, where, where were where we? Did you begin, uh, where did in, I begin? Naming, and, and, and pretend that you didn't just give us. Yeah, I can give you a slightly less rambling answer this time. <laughs> but the slightly less rambling answer is that I worked in a god awful corporate job, which was, you know, slowly sucking my brains out through my ears um and went to D &D in a castle which is summer camp for nerds and decided that this this was the thing that i was going to do forever that 15 16 year old me who thought he just wanted to write for me to the ascension had been correct the whole time and i should just do that now um and i came back and answered ashley warren's call for pitches for the anthology the uncaged anthology which was uh feminist oh. retellings of D, D monsters and feminist takes on mythological stories um unfortunately it was a very low bar for entry so i got selected uh there are many fantastic adventures in the uncaged anthology and also mine <laughs> <laughs> but like, what did you make what did you make for it uh what did i make uh my mind's gone blank and i can remember the whole of the adventure but not you what the monster is called thank you spouse from off camera just shouted you had a lamia i did i had a lamia um you can always count on off -camera <laughs> yeah uh feeding me lines making sure that sound like a complete idiot just like 70% idiot. Uh, yeah, so I chose the Lamia and I made a uh, misunderstood but powerful progressive monarch of a desert city, um, slowly, you know, crushing their enemies from a base out in the desert. And it was super fun. And nobody specifically wrote a comment to say that that adventure was like the suckiest part of the anthology. So I just kept going, really. I, as a person who has appeared in, in, in several fictional anthologies, uh, fictional in the sense that they are fiction, not that I made them up in my head, uh, but uh, I can say exactly that when you check out people's reviews and even if you're not mentioned, that can sometimes, that's fine, that's fine, as long as I wasn't mentioned on the bottom, that's all. Exactly. Like It's like that moment of relief on RuPaul's Drag Race when someone gets called it's safe and they go, I get to go and have a cocktail. See? Like, that's my life in reviews. Now you're speaking my language, you're talking RuPaul, we're in. Uh, <laughs> we're off to the races, my friend. The universal language of drag. It's true. It's tr it's actually how my wife and I bonded. Uh, uh, Amazing. Yeah, I got to meet that's really Trixie cool. Mattel once, and she saw that on Facebook, and she was like, well, I have to ask him questions about that. And uh, Of course. It was glorious. Uh, so uh, 
where did you go from there? What, what, uh, how did, how did it, how did it, you, you, that was your start. How did you start to pick up some steam? Well, you know, once you've done it once, you just keep faking it till you make it, right? So yes. I kept making things for the DMs Guild, which is a community content program for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Anyone can put stuff on there. If you think that you can write or you think that you could be a good writer or you just think that you would like some attention and you'd like some money, put your homebrew on the DMs Guild. It's great. Um, it's incredibly confidence boosting because sometimes people give you money for it, which is an amazing feeling. Um, and even if you get a load of shit from strangers online, you learn a lot. Like putting yourself out there for community content is, in some ways it's super easy, right? Because you pick all of your own briefs and you only have to write things that you like. But in another way, you are, you are fully exposed to customer sentiment. Um, if you make something, if you make a mistake, you're gonna know about it real fast. So it's community content, I think is really great for failing fast. That's good. That's good. And eventually maybe sort of failing a bit less and then maybe succeeding a little bit. Well, especially on the internet where people are notorious for not, uh, for keeping their opinions to themselves. Of course, uh, nothing but kindness and informed critique everywhere absolutely. you turn on the internet. Yeah. It, it do be like that. Oh, I love it. I love, I love that. I love the, 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 uh, what is it? The storyteller's path and, and everything like that. I just, that's become my, my little indie projects. And that's how I pay for like a third of my, uh, <laughs> RPG stuff, just the trade. basically. Yeah. Yeah. You just plowed immediately back to other purchases on indie RPG sites. Usually. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, I it's, it, it works out nicely and there's so much cool stuff on there. There's just Absolutely. stuff that otherwise would not get made, you know, because most companies, they got to think in terms of, how they can attract the most people with the most. And if you've got this weird little kick, this weird little niche thing you want to do, that's the place to do it. And you can find some really- Absolutely. Oh, like the great. best community content products are the ones that are for you and maybe like five to 10 other weirdos. Exactly, exactly. And those Like this little hole you. in your heart that you can fill. Oh, they will. Yeah. They will. They will find you and they will absolutely uh, uh, get in there and, uh, and, and tell you, what they think and ask you questions. I made a clan book for the fun of it for uh, uh, Vampire the Masquerade. And uh, within two weeks, I had someone writing me offering theories because I'd left some mysterious stuff in there and they're offering mm. me theories on what they think I'm getting at with my lore. And that was gratifying as all. Get out. It's like, you'd, you know, I'm just some guy, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So like there are absolutely moments where people have left me reviews and comments and I've gone, you are way smarter than I am. And I, I kind of wish you'd made the book. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's when you, as a, as a good writer, you lie and say, yes, that's exactly what I intended the entire time. Thank you for bringing yes, that up. Yes. This, this draws on references from so-and-so and so-and-so. And this, this author was very clearly thinking along these themes and I'm like, themes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sure am. Yes, sir. No, I, I didn't just sling words in a row. Nothing, nothing like that. No, no. Nothing like that. That would be that would be silly. Uh, yes. So, so when you uh, you started uh, putting out some community content like that, and when did uh, when did you get picked up by uh, by somebody else? When did they start to notice you? Is that how it happened anyway? Yeah, that is how it happened. Um, back in the days when Twitter was good, and you met people on Twitter, um, there was a lovely user called. I'm trying to remember her username, not her real name. Nepenthe Wong, um, who just like had read some of my stuff and tagged me in a reply to uh, Hunters Entertainment, who were looking for people to write a British altered carbon book. And I sent Ivan Van Norman, one of my little silly gothic horror adventures from the DMs Guild. And he went, oh, yeah, I think this guy might know what he's doing. He seems very British. And then he gave me a book, um, which is a stupid risk to take on like a brand new author who's never written anything professionally before. It's, you know, his 30,000 words make a book, um, which I think might be out now to the general public. But please don't look for it. Please chat. Just, <laughs> do it. Do it. Don't listen no, to him. No. Do it. No, it's like finding my teenage life journal. Um, don't <laughs> oh, look for that oh, either. Yeah. That's out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Everyone do your best to find Chance uh, uh, Live Journal. It's got to be out there. Good luck. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting all this out there. So what was, uh, is that was your first like professional gig? Yeah, that was my first professional gig. Um, 
and it was really fun because it was world building and there is nothing I love more than world and setting building. Um, making games themselves is fun. Writing adventures that express those games is fun. But just, you know, just leave me alone for a few weeks and let me make you an entire fantasy or cyberpunk world to run around in. And that's my happy place. So that's what I thought freelance writing was like. And then I did some other stuff. Then you just... <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, as they say, the story continues. Exactly. Uh, so, what were some of your earliest gaming influences? What were your what were your what was what, what brought you to the dance, so to speak? Oh, how far back do you want to go? Let's do, let's like, go do, do you want to talk about a little primary, but well, elementary school chant, getting the red D and D box, and going? I understand this. This is like books. I live um, for those stories. Yes, 100%. Which was definitely and absolutely a thing. Like, we had, okay, so I live in this moderately sized Welsh town. Um, the only bookshop that it had as a kid, we didn't have things like game stores in this small town. Like, don't get your hopes up here. Uh, <laughs> we had WH Smith's, which is a British chain of stationery and books, and now mostly just tacky shit um but for about a three month period they had a sale on their fantasy novels you could get a, a paperback novel for a pound and i bought like 20 forgotten realms and dragonlance and assorted D, &D novels uh, when i was just you know they were probably like some of the first grown-up novels that i read and i'm like aging single digits here which means i may have read weird elements to sex scenes before the age of 10 and blocked them out um, <laughs> it turns out from subsequent conversations which would explain a lot mm -hmm. um yes i had those books and you know i think my parents discovered this was something that he would do quietly indoors without making a fuss so they got me the like the red box D, &D basics box and that was it uh, make up stories, tell stories, eventually like force my way into the D and D game that some kids in my math class were playing, <laughs> just by turning my seat around and going. I heard the magic words. Yeah, <laughs> they couldn't get rid of me. Did somebody that's it. I mean, that's twenty. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that is the like absolute earliest influences. And then I spent my teens playing White Wolf games. Mm -hmm. Um, Vampire the Masquerade, and then Mage the Ascension, which is my true love. Um, it has like, I, I love my spouse and family very much. They can hear me, but Mage the Ascension has like the whole like left chamber of my heart. I think. Okay. Okay. The left chamber specifically, though. Specifically the left chamber. Okay. Yeah. I'll, all right. Now, now I uh, that was actually that's that's great because Mage is kind of a big blind spot for me personally. I've never played it. I don't know a lot about that particular world. Tell me, what, what is it about the mage that that really that that grabs you so hard? It's the gayest game that White Wolf ever made. Check, got it. <laughs> <laughs> mage, like all White Wolf games, are depending on how you play them. But as long as you're not a complete sociopath, they tend to be about a found family who are terrible and have to live with each other despite those flaws because everybody else wants to kill them. Um, mage is also very much about the construction of your identity through what you believe about magic, what you believe about how the world works and how you enforce that to, in, to the extent you can create the world that you want, despite the forces of the man. Um, it's pretty gay, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that ticks all the boxes right there. <laughs> but also you get to do incredible you get to do the most powerful overwhelming magical shit you could not do in any other system and you know you might turn yourself or reality inside out which is minor consequence but whatever sure. uh, but i love the idea in mage that it doesn't matter how much power you have power is not what solves problems mm -hmm. like you can't just throw force or force is mm -hmm. a problem until it goes away that's a, I mean, that's a that's a pretty good moral for everyone to take away, uh, especially from a role playing game. That's fantastic. OK, so what this might this might actually over overlap with what we were just talking about. What's what's your favorite franchise that you've ever had the pleasure of working on? A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little bit. <laughs> the, 
the noise I made when Travis Legg emailed me and said, hey, do you want to write a section for Law of the Traditions? Yeah. Like, I think I was heard three streets away, probably. <laughs> Neighbors thought I was being murdered and or having the best orgasm of my life. It was, it was intense. <laughs> so it took about five to ten minutes before I remembered that I had to actually reply to the email, not just run around the house screaming, I've got to write for Mage, I've got to write for Mage! You have to tell them um, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I had to get in there quick. So then I wrote for Mage. And honestly, like, I think that's it. That's when life peaked. That was the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me gaming wise. That's Sorry, all the other lines that I've written for. I think we're allowed to have favorites. You're not Mage. <laughs> no, we're allowed to have favorites. It's like children. You're allowed, if you have multiple children, you're allowed to pick a favorite. Of course. Of course you are. That. Yeah, everyone, everyone yeah. recognizes that. Um, Okay, now th this maybe this will line up too. What's what's uh, some of the work you're the proudest of? Something that you really, if, if you if you said this is what I'm all about as a game developer, as a writer, boom, read this. What what would you uh, what would you say? Damn. Um, See, we're coming with a hard hitting truth. Mm, That's it. I, I, yeah, I got choices here. Um, one of them might get me just lit up in chat i don't know but as a writer one of the things that i'm most proud of is um some setting building work that i did for age of sigma soulbound which is the warhammer fantasy cool. role-playing game it's really fun um it's a really big epic setting where you know power can solve all your problems like just get a bigger hammer uh -huh. and eventually you will be triumphant um but cubicle seven did a did an adventure path in a city called Greywater Fastness, and I got to make an. Uh, it's very Welsh, frankly, very Welsh, very Yorkshire, an industrial, a soulless industrial city where everything is sad and covered in gunpowder. It's like a, a real living setting in which people have wants and needs and ambitions and just space to exist, doing things other than what's in a war game. And it was really enjoyable. And I, I love that sort of filling in the blanks, like adding texture to a setting. So I think that was some, I think that was some really good work. But as a developer, I really enjoyed doing um, a book called Blind Drawn in Blood, which is an adventure set for the new Hunter the Reckoning, mm. uh, which, while well, obviously everything would be better if it was done by Onyx Path, is not done by Onyx Path. Um, but I think Hunter is genuinely one of the best games in the new world of darkness because i like little guys going up against things that can smash them like bugs um and having to fight back just with drive and desperation and grit and i think as a developer I, it's like the easiest book i've ever developed i picked a great team of authors who wrote me some really gnarly spooky stories that send the characters to some pretty unpleasant places if they're not careful and without spoilers and that's yeah, it's a book that delivered everything that I wanted it to. I love it. It's a book that, in the words of somebody at Paradox, who I respect quite a lot, goes way harder than we expected. <laughs> That's what you want. That's what yeah, you want. right? We want um, yeah. Okay, I can name drop just to the kid. He said, oh, the first book in a line is always kind of dodgy, but this one, this one fucking went places. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on my tombstone. Not as dodgy as we expected. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah, it's just... We we you we wanted you to go far, and you went even further than that. And they might the next thing. Anytime someone says that, the next thing I'm expecting them to say is, "We need you to back off." It's not, but, but I can't. <laughs> I can't stop singing and dancing in celebration to the point where I, I've never I never pick up on what they're saying. So it doesn't matter. If uh, anyone's ever tried to tell me to do less, it's fallen on absolutely blissfully unaware ears. Yeah, they're, they're it's always going, more. They're going to the wrong people. Uh, make it worse make it weirder yeah yes exactly yeah, make okay it, make it gayer make it weirder yeah i love it i that. love it i love it okay what uh outside of role-playing game books because i i personally read those like history books of worlds that never existed um, oh boy there's like a 25 minute com well no it's a 25 minute rant in there we are going to come back to that let's do it oh please yeah yeah well oh I, okay I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled let's let's do that uh outside but outside for now of role-playing game books uh what, what what is some of your recommended reading for any budding developers or writers or or just geek 
uh, 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 you know, charlatans out there. Okay, so I'm going to start saying there are lots of amazing academic works on game design now and game writing. Um, and there are lots of really clever people in this space who have educations and stuff and didn't come here for a job when they talked about salary eight hours a day. And those people will recommend you some of the coolest brain training shit in the world. Um, I just think that if you want to make good role-playing games, you should play role-playing games, right? I think anything you could read or watch or consume is only as good as what you get out of it and the way that you apply the knowledge you have is to play more games. So um, quit your job, quit your hobbies, play more games. I love it. That's, that's, that's the best genuinely advice. my best advice. That's it. That's it. I love it. Okay, so what, now let's go back, though. Let's take a step back. What, what you, we, you hinted at a rant here about reading. Uh, I, I do, I, for, the, for the record, I love, I probably read more role-playing game books cover to cover than I play, um, simply because I, I love just delving into it and, and devouring it and learning about the mechanics, and then it won't be, it will be a year until I actually roll dice in that day. Exactly. Game. So exactly. Like everyone has the stack, right? Or possibly the bookcase of oh, shame. Yes. I don't know how big it is for everybody out there. Uh, mine is a bookcase of shame. shame. You go and you buy five games and you sit and you read them. And you go, Oh my God, that's amazing. I have to get this to the table. Then you spend eight months trying to persuade your group to play it instead of whatever they're currently into. And by then like, you've got another shelf of shame and another 10 things. So in my humble opinion, role-playing, game books are designed to be read yes like that is how they are experienced first and foremost and i have this personal gripe when people say and this is a comment that i got on a draft i sent to a publisher recently um not on its path by the way but to someone who said hmm this chapter really feels like it was designed to be read more than played and i, I kind of just thought babe it's a setting chapter if you can't sit down and read it something's gone horribly wrong um, I think people underestimate GMs a hell of a lot uh, when it comes to writing and publishing role-playing books because I think they forget that we are all GMs and players are like first and foremost we're like huge supernovas of imagination in a meat bag what we really want is like just a we want a book that gives us ideas and gives us starting points I think for our own games and where we want to take a set of mechanics or a setting i think people underestimate the power of good writing therefore in an rpg book like it uh, clarity is obviously like the main goal if people can't understand what you're trying to say on that page you may as well not have written it but i think there is room in rpg writing for beautiful prose pithy wording and just little tiny fragments that get your mind working and I think sometimes that means the best thing you can do as a writer is drop some hints or leave a little bit of mystery and leave some spaces for players and GMs to fill in because it's really damn arrogant of us to think that we can do a better job of that than every gaming table out there in the world. Absolutely. That's the rant. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm, I'm big on that myself. I, uh, I write plays a lot of the time. And one of the things that I have gotten really, uh, I've had, I have a lot of fun with is writing things into the setting and the description stuff that's never going to get seen by the majority of the people who are the audience will never hear it. They'll never see it. It's just something for the director and for the actors to read and hopefully comes across with like some of the attitude of what you're going. Yeah. With. And I think that that's really valuable within gaming books as well. I totally agree. Yeah, I think there's magic in those tiny little corners that a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, you hope some people are going to see them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where things can be really special and a little bit more than just an instruction manual. I, I totally agree. All right, VZ in the chat says uh, they've got a couple of shelves uh, of, <laughs> of shame. So I've got, I've got a couple of them behind me uh, currently. I still, I've got a lot to get into. And there's so much, and I mean, that's the thing with mechanics and different ways of coming up with, look, I love, I love a setting book as much as anybody. That's wonderful. But just the different ways of playing games uh, that go beyond dice that go beyond. Uh, and that actually brings me to my next question. Is there, is there a, 
What's the what's a, a mechanic or a rule that you read recently that really made you go, oh shit, that's that's cool. Like that's a that's a fun idea, something that goes a little beyond what you're used to, or just caught you off guard. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted because I can see I'm phasing in and out of existence on camera. Um, we'll bit. put it down to like a special Halloween effect. Yeah, I don't really... yeah. yeah, maybe if I just stay really still, it'll be fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> hmm, mechanics that I adore. Um, I love any pushy luck mechanic. Um, I love and keep reusing it's why i keep making trophy hack games um trophies dark dice mechanic like you can always try harder you can always push yourself further mm -hmm. but you're doing so with a huge risk of consequences to yourself and everyone around you it's beautiful and it's so thematic for a game of taking one last risk until you can't risk anymore mm -hmm. um that was one of my first experiences of a mechanic that I thought really pushed the game rather than just wanting mechanics to be unobtrusive, which I think was my goal previously, right? You just want something that's, I wanted something that was smooth and let me be really fiction first. And then I saw this, you know, trophies, light and dark dice. And I thought, oh, holy shit, you can actually, mechanics have to mean something, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I still think it's really smooth. It's really adaptable. You can, you can make small changes to it and really change the tone of a game. And I think it's really fun to play in that space and keep seeing how far you can change what that means, basically. And how catastrophic the results can be in the end. I... And how catastrophic the results can be. And who they're catastrophic for. Yeah. There is a game that I haven't written yet, but want to, where you're not the one who pays the price. Oh, now that's interesting. Okay, so if you if you fuck up, that it, it's not going to be you who suffers because of it. It's not you, but it's one of it's one of your friends. It's one of the other players at the table. Can you tell us a little more about that? That's really cool. I have not figured it out yet. I think the context that it goes in is probably like some kind of abducted by the Fey game, right? Like fight your way out of a Fey bargain, because that's the theme I keep coming back to. Um, you can't be British and not have nightmares about fairy tale creatures. I, 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 I think. think it's required by law. Actually. Yeah, I think so. I think there's like a, a quota of them of these nightmares that we all have to have. <laughs> and I, I love the idea that I think it also comes back to obvious neuridicy, which is a motif that I get in my work a lot. Right? Of you can't you can't save everybody, or you might be able to get yourself out, but you can't necessarily get out clean. Um, which is certainly one way of interpreting that motif, if not the most like obvious one. Um, and yeah, I like this idea of seeing, of creating a game where you fundamentally have to work as a team to get anything done, but the price of your failure is shared as well as your success is. I love it. Yeah. I haven't quite figured out when or how I'm going to do this, but once it turns into something more coherent, that will happen. I love that. I love. I I think. I think there is actually, especially for those of us who have been playing games since we were little kids, there is a growth period there. And the marker is when you realize that failure within the game is actually way more fun than being a superhero who gets everything that they want all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it depends on the type of game, right? Like, but you know, you can't, I can't think of a single piece of media where the arc is hero gets what they want consistently and never fails until they end and have a triumph. Right. Like that's, that's no fun. So yeah, what games do with failure and how they make failure interesting, I think is a really good measure of how long you can play a game for oh, without right. it getting kind of repetitive. And it, and it taps into everything. It taps into the game. It taps into who you're playing with, who your storyteller is. It, everybody, you're finding that rhythm is so important uh, in general. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, are there any? This is this is kind of a funny question. I, I I realized almost immediately that this is this is a funny question to ask for a show like this. But I, I'm very curious. Are there any pre-written campaigns or modules or anything that have stuck with you over the years? Like maybe you know, just I know because I know we're talking to writers and creators on this show. So the idea is we're all the DMs who made up our own you know, uh, a dungeon, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we are. Uh, uh, but are there any pre-made stuff? Because I, I find that, especially with the old D&D &D stuff, that stuff kind of, 
it's entering into the halls of legend in a weird way. And so I like to check with people to see if there's anything. Oh my gosh. I'm, I want a t-shirt that says, I survived the temple of elemental evil. Oh, yeah. You, if you um, deserve that t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Not with the same character I went in with, but I did it. it, it uh, yeah, exactly. I got to the end of the temple of elemental evil. Um, when I was like 12 or 13 and we had nothing to do all summer but play D&D, &D, we just did this. Um, I don't know that it, it both does and doesn't stick with me in a good way, right? I, I love that. I love meat grinders. I love killer dungeons to this day. Um, give me a DCC funnel and I'm a happy boy for the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I think you get a lot of emergent play from situations like that rather than kind of highly scripted narrative things but also god damn that is a horribly adversarial module and i think that was the one where i learned that it's not fair if you're not on the player's side yeah yeah uh, I, I, the tomb of horrors comes to mind as well it's yeah a, just just needlessly antagonistic nasty, absolutely nasty yeah 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 and it's like it can be a really fun play style as long as everybody's on board and nobody's invested in you know, their particular character, oh, you yeah. become invested through the things your character survives. And that's a super fun style of play to me. Um, yeah, it's one of the, a lot of the subtlety and D modules, I'm afraid, are defining in the sense of teaching me that I wanted to try other types of games. I think that makes sense, Sorry. though. I mean, no, I think that makes perfect sense because D and D. Look, I love D and D. We, that's it was most of our entry point into this world. There's Absolutely. But I do believe that it is a terrific springboard. It's a great start. Uh, but it's I find that with professionals and with people who are who take gaming really seriously, it's rarely the one that you just stick with throughout. It's it. It's, it's a great place to get started, but then you start finding these weird, niche, complicated little games that, uh, that are, like you said, more focused on the story and, and that sort of thing. And, and I, t I think that makes total sense. And I don't think it says anything negative about D&D &D necessarily either. Good, because I wouldn't want to, because yeah, it is a first experience for most people. And it's one that we keep going back to. Yeah. And if we didn't gel with D&D &D at least a little bit, we probably wouldn't stay in the hobby. Right. So I think D&D &D gets a lot of criticism, a lot of it justified. Sure. But, you know, it's like movie theater popcorn, right? It's not actively bad. It's just sort of there and sometimes it scratches the itch and sometimes it just doesn't, you know? Yeah, I no, I, I totally agree. Um, so what is, a, what is a gaming, we've talked a lot about the games that uh, you love the games you played. What are give give me a few blind spots? What are some games that you wish you have had the chance to play or sit down and learn more about? And you just there's only twenty four hours in the day. God damn you! What am I supposed to do? <laughs> uh, nobody has run Cyberpunk Red for me yet, and that oh, is disgusting. Okay. And somebody needs to fix it <laughs> immediately. Chat um, anyone out there? Like if you offer me a Cyberpunk game, I will play it um, on stream for charity um in the privacy of your attic whatever um so that is like a very specific blind spot but also i would love to play a powered by the apocalypse game with a really skilled facilitator because i don't think i've ever really gotten the most out of powered by the apocalypse as a play space or a design space i feel like i don't really get it and i would like to get it that's that's one of those that's one of those systems that you hear kind of spoken of uh, by the real by the real geeks. Uh, it's I, I'm the same way. I haven't I haven't uh, really gotten a chance to get into that one yet. But I it sounds very intriguing. It sounds cool. Yeah, I th I get the impression that when you get the design correct, um, I mean I have played some Powered by the Apocalypse. I've played Bluebeard's Bride, and Bluebeard's Bride is a beautiful game that does exactly what it sets out to do. And it's why I think I've like missed the point with a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse. Because if you if you hit it absolutely correct in Powered by the Apocalypse and you create moves and notes that fully support where you want the game to go, it's a really beautiful, smooth, frictionless experience in terms of the fiction and the mechanics coming together. Uh, if you don't, it's really clunky and can feel really constraining and a little bit like you have to overthink how you want to translate your character into action. Um, 
And I think that's on me, not the game. I think I need someone who really, really gets it to run something like Monster Hearts for me and show me how that is supposed to flow. Mm -hmm. So that's another request, please. If anybody wants to run BBTA games for me, I'm, I'm right here. I'm begging you. <laughs> I think that's, I make, that makes a lot of sense. And that could just make sense for rules, too. I remember once on, on Twitter, uh, a place I'm not at anymore, uh, <laughs> that's, we do not speak of, we do not of speak X. These, these, these places, these dark, dark places. Uh, oh, I, I remember once as a smart ass joke, just re throwing out something like, um, I, I don't remember even what I said, but basically I was saying nobody uses encumbrance rules in D and D. Oh. You know why? If you, oh boy, why did you kick that that wasp's nest? I <laughs> kicked that wasp nest, and the old grog nest came out of the woodwork for me and made very good points. A lot of them made very good points, and 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 it was kind of like what you were saying. It's about having the the right atmosphere, the right people. If you're going into a game where you're going to be paying attention to all of that stuff, there could be something really enjoyable about that. And honestly the more they described it to me, the more I was like, well, shit, why won't anyone run a game like that for me? I'd, I'd play yeah. a game, like a real dungeon yeah, roll kind of thing. Yeah, like I'm hoping they came out and said encumbrance is an exploration mechanic. Yeah. And because 5e's exploration pillar is not that strong, no. encumbrance in 5e has like very little purpose. But yeah, if you're digging through ancient crypts, it's like, do you want the magic sword or do you want the healing potion? Exactly. Choose yeah. now. Yeah. And that, you know, Choices are fun. Hard choices are brilliant. Yeah, so it's, encumbrance has a place, absolutely. Yeah, and and it also depends on the kind of game you're playing. I think that is one of the advantages to games that are so broad based, like D and D, because you can have a game where it's basically soap opera of the week, and we're all having our feelings, and every now and then we fight a monster or something like that. Or you can have a very technical game where you have grid paper and uh, you know old school shit and and you're keeping Fuck track of yeah and, uh, oh yeah absolutely I just, okay uh, uh, i can't carry this much gold i have to trade it in for gems uh yeah they're easier to carry yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that I, I think there's room for both and you just have to know which game you're playing because it's kind of hard to 100 percent. Yeah. yeah 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 my favorite example of mechanics is something um, Chris Bissett talks about doing in one of their games, which is they put the most valuable thing in the dungeon is a door. It's this pair of adamantine double doors, and it will like make your family's fortunes to the tenth generation if you can get it out. But it's a massive pair of double doors, right? <laughs> right, and that is a pure encumbrance problem, and it's so much fun to solve. And like, That's the idea of watching players sit in front of this door, like theorizing and strategizing about ways to get rich off it for yeah. a whole session do just we, charms and delights me do we go back to the town and hire a bunch of people what do we do yeah oh, exactly great. i love that that's so much fun uh okay now this this is probably just going to be mage again but i'm going to ask anyway uh <laughs> it's, what, uh, you know and we might do it uh what what uh, if if it is then what's what other than mage is this but what's what's a, your favorite game to run as a storyteller or a dm or what have you not to play in. Yeah, it's actually not Mage. Oh, okay. I find running Mage really hard. Like, I love playing Mage and I love writing for Mage. Um, I find running it hard because everybody's expectations of Mage are really different. Mm -hmm. um, and I always feel like I've got a responsibility to almost run 10 games in one. Sure. When I'm running Mage, um, <laughs> which I find tiring. Mage is my favorite game to play with. With just my spouse, we do some like great one-on-one -on -one games of Mage. But anyway, um, mm, favorite game to run. I am really, really enjoying running Hollows by Rowan Rook and Deckard, which is in playtesting, okay. which is a quite Dark Souls-y thing where you fight um, basically the real monster is capitalism all along, spoilers, or possibly colonialism all along, spoilers. Shock me, shock me, shock me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but it's a kind of pseudo-Victorian setting where you're sort of lancing the boils of evil and corruption that appear across the country and trying to at least stop them from like fully exploding and destroying everything around them. Um, while also becoming more powerful by like making weapons out of the bones of your enemies. Good times. Um, I'm sorry, I find what that. What is this game called again? I have to write this down. This is amazing. <laughs> it's called Hollows. It's in playtesting and it's free. Hollows. It's free for you to go and download it now and play it. And I'm... it's so much fun. It's, just wild that sounds really um cool. and it's in like so many of my sweet spots because it's that bloodborne 
Victoriana Gothic setting and the everything is more powerful than the players vibe and um, and also the the kind of thing where the players are going to have to get their hands dirty and put themselves in real danger in order to reap real rewards and it's just like everything that I love. Oh, and the published mm -hmm. scenarios for it are so good. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm, I'm just thinking about running hollows again. <laughs> then get off this and start another, another gaming group. Um, but when I, you know, don't want to kill characters, I love 7th C, uh, specifically first edition 7th C, because I am nothing if not a grognard in the making. Oh, absolutely. So pirates and swashbuckling and um, not being able to die unless you agree with it as a player, which is uh, kind of useful if you've got a killer DM like me. That's always handy. That's all, I, I, I'm lucky to have had uh, the sort of DMs uh, in the past who will come to me ahead of time and be like, it's looking like your character's going to die. Are you, are you cool with that? Or sort of take me aside. Because yeah. nine times out of ten, I'll go, yeah, sure, fine. You know, um, Let's do it. As long as it's interesting. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know. As long as it means something. Dying to bad dice? incredibly boring dying to bad decisions fantastic 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 couldn't agree more okay uh what is uh some of your advice for uh again budding game developers writers anyone who wants to be involved in a professional way in this industry other, so, other than play games because you already made that other one. than play games yes yeah you made that like one the big secret that no one tells you is you can just do it like no one can stop you yeah <laughs> you can just make a game and, and and sell it and people will find it um make friends with streamers streamers and content creators are your best friends for getting things noticed but don't it's all very well to like be sending samples and resumes to publishers and think, please hire me the best way to get noticed is to have already made a game and there is literally nothing stopping you. There are community content programs out there for D and D, for Onyx Path content on the Storytellers Vault and the Story Path Nexus, uh, the Miskatonic Repository for Call of Cthulhu. Because I know your little Ghibli fans. <sighs> Honestly, yeah, just just make it. Um, make the game. Run it for your friends. Stick it on the internet and get some people to help you talk about it. Don't don't wait to be noticed. Just go and make your own luck. I love it. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps actually kind of does work in role-playing games, it right. turns out, and right. nowhere else. Um, so, yeah, so so go do that. Um, um, and don't be shy about the things you make. They're fucking cool. You bet your ass they're cool. That's exactly what we were talking about with this community stuff. There's, yeah. There are so many things, out, so many ideas out there that people haven't done, that they haven't touched, that they don't, they don't even know about yet. And if you've got an idea and you could sit there and go, oh, it's probably so niche. No one wants to do this. And yeah, you know what? Maybe there are a dozen people who, who would like to read what you're talking about, but those dozen people are never going to forget what you made. And it's going to mean so much to them. So make it, make the damn thing. Yeah. Make it and enjoy this period where you can, where you get to only make things that you love and you want to make. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what are uh, what are some games uh, or uh, what are some games that you wish more people knew about? Seventh C first edition. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> oh oh gosh, I don't think I'm a player of particularly obscure games. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I think that Free Geeks Coriolis is a tragically overlooked game. It's like Alien meets Arabian Nights, and it's like tell me that's not a strong concept. Um, it's a game that I don't feel has gotten the love it deserves, and I think more people should be out there playing crews of ships that they can't entirely afford to maintain and upkeep, mm -hmm. experiencing weird mythological horror in the furthest reaches of space and the dark between the stars. Love it. I love it. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? Um, okay, now let's let's wrap up with uh, the most important question. What What is something that you're working on right now that you can talk about? NDA, but also NDA. Oh, and then there's that other thing that's under NDA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of cool stuff that I have. Um, I'm either working on. Um, I have seen inside the new edition of Pugmire, and I can tell you that it is very cool and oh, full of very good dogs. Really to no surprise. That. Yeah. Um, it feels like it's dialing up some of the sort of very classic fantasy Conan-esque influences, which I think is a super cool thing to do and a really fun direction to go in um i 
mentioned the world below briefly which is kickstarting now yes. which i'm not working on but i am sort of like working on matthew to let me maybe make something for a stretch goal <laughs> so i'll slide into his dms after this and just be like hey remember how much i love this game um if anyone has missed out on the world below it is um the deepest of dungeon crawlers the darkest of dungeons um the entire surface is ruined and you and your friends and loved ones are eking out a post post apocalyptic uh, existence in the cavern as miles below the surface oh my god we love a post apocalypse um but i guess i should also plug one of my own things which is an anthology called do not adjust your sets which is coming to kickstarter on halloween on tuesday and that's a little book of system neutral horror scenarios based on urban legends and it's got it will have stuff by me it's got uh adventures by natalie ash and madame ember who are super cool indie designers and it's also got some stuff from your onyx path faves matthew dawkins and Tra travis leg in Beautiful. so it's, it's quite a hit list of super cool people doing super cool adventures while i take all of the credit oh isn't that nice so it's cool right oh it's the best it's just the best. And I'm about to make like possibly the stupidest move of my writing career because I'm going to let backers choose what I write about. My adventure's not done yet. I'm going to let you all pick an urban legend and I'll I'll do that. You are a brave person. That is that is. Someone has already threatened me with Bigfoot pigeons, oh, so boy. Like, okay. I really need to get the backer numbers up so I don't have to write Bigfoot pigeons. So that pigeons, isn't please. automatically it. Yeah, that's that's tough. That's tough. Yeah, it's, otherwise it's going to be the horror of boating at boat face. I just fucking know it. It's going to be I've done to myself. Boat face. Absolutely, it is, and it's going to yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, this is this is why I don't believe in democracy when it comes to uh, role playing <laughs> games. I'm not. I don't trust any of you people. That's not how this works. Uh, well, no, no, I will give the people what they want, and then you will all find out how much you didn't want to hand me this power. Yeah. You know what? That's a, you know what? That's good. That's that's the sweetest revenge. Uh, the sweetest revenge of all. I love it. Oh man, uh, well, it's not living well. It's causing nightmares. It's causing that's nightmares. what we're here to do. I I don't want to live well so much as I want to ruin your life. That's more what it's. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm I'm with See, you. See, you that. get me. I, yeah. Yeah. We 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 we're we're on we're on board here. This this works. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Chip, for joining me. Uh, can you uh, uh, anything you want to plug? Any places people can find you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? Um, go follow the Kickstarter page. It's Kickstarter. Do not adjust your set. Google will get you there. Um, if you think I've said a single thing worth hearing in the last sixty minutes, you can follow me on. You can follow me on X dot com or on Blue Sky, which is where I actually am most of the time, or on Facebook or on Instagram as Ecstasis Games. That's E-X-Stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. Yes, it's a Call of Ecstasy reference, games. Um, <laughs> or check us out on ecstasisgames.com. Excellent. And uh, my name is Phil Keeling. Uh, you can find me on Blue Sky at Phil Makes Monsters. Uh, you can also find my uh, podcast, Pixel Lit, uh, the best podcast uh, that covers novelizations of video games because it's the only podcast that covers <laughs> video game novelizations. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, and I've got my first book, Juice, coming out in November, so mm -hmm. follow me on Blue Sky to get more details on that. Uh, but in the meantime, in between time, thank you guys so very, very much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.